The following presentation was recorded live in Kansas City, Missouri for Coral Lab's 23rd Annual Convention. This is tape number 10, Teaching Techniques, Basic Mainstream. Good afternoon. I'm Laurel Eddy. As moderator, I'd like to welcome you to the session on mainstream or basic and mainstream teaching techniques. This is one of several sessions which is uh, going to deal with how we teach and the process of learning those teaching techniques in order to make us better in our profession. There are several other sessions, and I'd like to encourage all of you to go to those. They sort of piggyback one on the other. Here we have basic. The next session will be mainstream, and then the session behind that is going to be plus. So if you get a chance, or if not, all these sessions are on tape, so we encourage you to buy those tapes if you miss on one of those. Because this, this session is taped, we're going to ask that you, if you have a question or comment, and we will have time for that at the end of the session, if you'll be sure to speak into a mic. We have a handheld mic up here. We'll get that to you. We'll try to find somebody to, to move it around the room if we need to. But if you will put it on the tape so that those people who aren't able to be with us can understand the question, we'll also try to repeat it on the main mic before we get started. I'd like to introduce the folks who are going to be on the panel with me. This is, this is quite an honor because I, I look at both of these fellows and think these are probably the cream of the crop as far as teaching goes. They have not only the skills but the compassion to be teachers, and I think that's important in the teaching process. From California, we have Jack Murtha, very involved in our education committee, and our soon-to-be chairman of the board, Jerry Junk from Mesa, Arizona now, I guess, right? Nebraska. He, he moves around a lot. Um, all of you have a handout called Mainstream Teaching Techniques, and it has a box up at the top. I'm just going to give a brief overview so we can sort of all get on the same track, and then from there we'll go on into some specific teaching ideas. I love this quote. The art of, they're right up here on the front if you didn't get one. The quote is, the art of teaching is completely and totally separate from the art of learning. Learning does not always pl take place as a result of teaching. If no learning takes place, then teaching is a vain effort with no visible result. How many times have all of us gone into a teaching situation, a class, a workshop, and we've just done our very best to teach these people and nobody learned anything? I mean, all of us can probably relate to that at some point. And we thought, what have I done wrong? I've done everything the way I've always done it, or I tried this new idea that Susie down the road told me to try, and nobody learned anything. Well, I think we first have to look at the difference between teaching and learning. Teaching and learning are both active processes. One involves us as the teacher, and as the teacher, it is our job to convey some information or some sort of material. The process of learning means that that information has actually been retained and can be brought back up and not just regurgitated. That doesn't mean that there's any real learning, and I think that's a lot of times where we miss the boat. It doesn't mean that we can't spit the information back out, because a lot of times people can and they still haven't learned anything. Uh, I taught fourth grade, and my fourth graders could memorize any list you wanted to put out there. They couldn't tell me what in the world that had to do with anything until we, we made it have something to do with some sort of application. And that's where learning really takes place, when you can apply whatever material has been taught into a real-life situation. Now, there are a lot of things that we can do to help facilitate that transition between teaching and learning. And as a good caller, as a good instructor and a good teacher, we need to utilize all of those. One of the most important is to realize that people do not all learn at the same rate of speed or at the same methods. There are several, um, and they're listed right down here, there are about five styles that most education professors will tell you uh, determine how somebody will actually learn. One of those is rote learning, and that's what we were just talking about a minute ago, where I give you a list and you spit the list back out to me, and then we do it again and again and again, and you learn through repetition. The, other, uh, the second is auditory learning. You're just hearing it. And there are some people that if you tell them something one time, they can remember it. Phone numbers are a prime example. If I can tell somebody who is an auditory learner a phone number, they're going to remember it and never have any trouble giving it back to me or going to the phone and dialing it. If you are a rote learner and I tell you a telephone number, until you repeat that over and over in your head or verbally or you write it down several times, you are not going to remember it. So 
people, there are some people who are exclusively rote learners, and there are some who are exclusively auditory learners. Then we get to visual learners who, if I read it in a book or I see it down on a piece of paper, I can tell you what it said. Those are the kinds of people who have photographic memories, especially. They are exclusively visual learners. Then we've got those people who take everything apart and rebuild it in their own mind. And if they can tell you how it actually works, then they have learned it. Those are the analytical learners. And you'll find some of those in your, uh, in your lesson groups as well. And then finally, the last is an emotional learner. I think sometimes these are the most difficult to teach because you don't always know that they're emotional learners. Emotional learners are those who take some sort of material and they relate it to something that has some emotional value to them. An example, when I teach uh, walk and dodge, I teach it as somebody opening a van door and somebody putting in a, set of, a sack of groceries. Well, for the person who is an emotional learner who can look at that and say, oh yes, I know that when I go to buy groceries, I feel so good because I'm taking care of my family and I know I'm going to go home and cook them a nutritious meal, then those people click into that definition immediately. Now, for me, that means nothing. It means nothing to tell me to slide open a van door and put in a sack of groceries because I just am not that kind of a thinker. But those people immediately relate to that. They are probably the most difficult to get to because you have to paint very different pictures than we do for those other learners. Ways that we can take those types of exclusive learners and integrate their learning process into our teaching methods are first by repetition. For the rote learner, you just do it over and over and over again. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to give instruction over and over and over again, but they're the type of people who do need practice, so repetition is important. The second, the auditory learner, those people who hear, it's a, for those people it is essential that we use very clear, concise, understandable terms. If we begin to talk in definitions that are above their heads, if they don't understand what a static square is, then they are not ever going to comprehend the idea of a side space grand square because they don't understand the starting point. So we have to say, instead of saying static square for the auditory learner, we might need to say, when you're at home and everybody is squared up. Now this is called a static square. Okay, now you've given them the definition, they have an understanding, they're not at ground zero anymore and they can comprehend where you go from there. For the visual learners, we have to have things that they can actually see. If you can get a square up and show them what this is supposed to look like as they do it, they pick up on that much more quickly than they will if you just give them some instructions verbally. Um, the analytical learner are probably the toughest for us as square dancers to carry in things for them to utilize. There are books. All right. these, these types of books for the basics and mainstream teach, these are great because they have pictures as well as diagrams. They can look at those. They give step-by-step -step instructions and they say, this is what the mental picture is going to be at this point, and then when you've done this many more steps, this is what it's going to look like. They can break that down. So those types of things are wonderful. Graphs, charts, pictures, if you've got videos, those are the kinds of people who probably benefit greatly from throwing a video in the VCR and watching it and rewinding it and watching it again. And then again, we get to those emotional learners who really do need very, very graphic word pictures that did elicit some sort of emotional response from them. And that's probably what we as callers have a very difficult time doing because most of us are not going to fall into that category simply because of, of what we do as square dance callers. We probably are not going to be emotional learners. Now this does not mean that everybody is exclusively any one of these. Most people are going to be a mixture of several of these, auditory and visual or analytical and rote. Probably not those two together, but auditory and analytical. It's important that you analyze the folks who are on your dance floor as you're in the teaching process and say, now what kind of people do I have out there? A real good indication is to look at your folks and see what kind of occupations they're involved with. That sometimes will give you an idea. Asking questions, getting to know your folks, really, really, really important because you're going to get some feedback as to how they best understand. And if all else fails and you have a real enigma out there and you say, I don't know, I don't have any idea how this person learns, go and ask them. You know, how would you best learn, if I were to give you a new move, 
Would you rather me just tell you how to do it, or would you rather me show you a picture, or draw a graph? What would be best for you? Most people can pretty well uh, do a self-analysis very quickly and tell you what type of learner they are. Now, I think that's sort of a basis so that we all start off at the same point as to what type folks are out there to learn. But you came here for some very specific teaching techniques. And to help out with that, I'd like to now turn the mic over to Jerry Junk, who's going to give you some of that information. Jerry? All right. Thank you, Laurel. Where are we? Here? Okay. I'm going to um, talk about several things. And I'm, the first thing I'm going to talk about is a teaching technique that I don't think any of us really give much, uh, much thought to. And that's the, the technique of how do you handle people? How do you handle new dancers their first time? Um, teaching is the most important thing we do as callers. It is our greatest challenge, and it has several facets. It, uh, teaching is many things. It's the act of communicating knowledge, um, but it's actually much more than that. It's the art of uh, instructing, training, educating, guiding, if you would, and actually is the act of, of teaching people to discipline themselves to follow commands. And that's basically what we do as a square dance caller, is we discipline people to react to a command that we give them. Um, I view teaching more of an art and a feel than I do anything else. I think you have to have a feel for teaching. You can develop that. But I really do think that teaching is, is a feel for people. Uh, the theme of our convention here is improving your product. And I think if you're going to do a class, first thing you need to do, you have to prepare, you have to take a look at your presentation, and then you have to follow up with it. Um, teaching techniques involve a number of areas, from the obvious of how to develop your teaching program to actually how do you teach a call, how do you present it to the people. And in order to do that, I think you have to be able to read your floor. And I talked to you just a minute ago about people techniques. I, all of us have called many of us for a long time, and I think we forget how difficult it is for people to learn to square dance. And we all forget that because we all dance, and most of our friends do, that we don't have a real feel for the fear that people have when they come to take a square dance class. We don't go down the street doing an alaman left and right and left grand, just that simply. And they come in, um, usually the wife dragging the, the husband dragging rut two feet or two ruts right through the door so right away you have someone who isn't happy to be there but it was come or else or you had some friends that brought them so you have a little reluctance on the part of some of the people that come to class in the first place they don't want to be there and I don't think we address that well enough now that's one of the techniques something that I do whenever I start a class is that I try to greet everyone as they come in the door, or it's at least some time before I start the class. And I do that for two, two reasons. First of all, they need to know me. They need to know that even though I'm an instructor, I'm down on the floor, I'm one-on-one -on -one with them, I try to shake everybody's hand, and in doing that, when you shake someone's hand, you can tell if that's a clammy hand. That person is afraid. They're afraid. Uh, I think you need to be aware of that that there are people like that in your crowd. Then you get the one who will grab your hand and, all right, you'll show me what you can do. You get that person also. That person's easy to teach. But the other person's the one you want to look out for, and that's the person you can lose instantly. And as I get ready to start the class, and I get everybody up in a circle. And I'll, uh, first thing I teach is an alaman left, a dose do, a circle left, circle right, talk about the handholds. But when I want to teach that alaman left and do so do, I go find that lady who had the sweaty palm. And that's the lady that I take on the floor to demonstrate with. And I'll just take her out there and I said, you know, this lady came in early, and she promised to help with this. And when I grab her, she dies right there on the spot, right in front of him. And she drags her right with two feet as you go out on the floor. But it accomplishes two things. The very person that is most afraid 
and as most they're not afraid of you they're afraid of making mistakes they're afraid of looking bad of embarrassing themselves I don't think we're aware enough of that and by taking this lady out on the floor to do a do sa do I accomplish two things first of all she learns that I'm not going to bash her on the head with a microphone that I'm right down there on the floor with her and I'm looking right at her and her husband chances are just like her but I put my hands on her when I do a dose of dough and I explain the dose of dough. It accomplishes two things. It takes away that fear factor and secondly, she's the one that's going to need that one-on-one -on -one anyway. But if I take her out on the floor and say, well, you, you've got to come out here because you're going to have trouble, she will. She truly will. But you take her out there as a joke. You know, this lady came in, promised to help me. You eliminate a little bit of that fear factor each time that you do that. And I try to take a different lady or a different couple each time that I demonstrate. I do get on the floor to demonstrate. Uh, I like the fact of calling off a stage, but I like the fact to get on the floor with people so that you're one-on-one, -on -one, that you're not looking down at them all the time. And I think that takes away some of that fear factor that uh, is created when you teach lessons. Anyway, I, I'll teach a do -so do I'll teach an Alaman left, and I teach a number of calls in this manner. Uh, later on, when you get down to a flutter wheel, I'll take the couple out that's, by then, of course, they've danced long enough. You know who's going to have the trouble. You take this couple out on the floor with another lady, and you teach a flutter wheel. You show them how it's done, how it will dance, how it looks, what it does. And then you also show them now, after we get doing this pretty good with these two couples, I'll say, now this is what you're going to see. And I'll say, ladies, lead, flutter wheel, or whatever you say, uh, right and left through, turn the girl, flutter wheel. And I'll say, this is what you see, boys. And I just froze, stand frozen right to the ground. Well, then you make a big uh, exhibit of yourself as to charging around there with the girl. And everybody laughs. That won't happen to them. But the first time you call a flutter wheel, all the boys are glued right to the ground. But they remember that. And they have a, have a little fun with it. Well, he said we'd do that. We did. And uh, those are the things that I think we need to understand, that there's a great deal of fear involved in learning to square dance. Not because people are dumb. I, d I don't think people are dumb. But they are embarrassed, especially as they get older. They're much easier, or they are embarrassed much more than they are when they're younger. I think that's why younger people tend to learn a little quicker. Um, if they make a mistake, oh well. As we get older, uh, it's very embarrassing to make a mistake. So that's a fear factor, and I, uh, I really think that it's, it's a people technique that we need to develop. We need to become a little more one-on-one -on -one with our beginning dancers. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some of the ways that I teach, some of the calls that I teach. I'm not going to take a lot of time because Jack has quite a few things. Jack and I are, are not going to agree on everything. He's going to teach things pretty much strictly by the book. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with, with what he's saying. Uh, I work in a different situation in Mesa in the parks. We've reworked our teaching sequence uh, to some extent to make teaching quicker, that we can take people faster. We only have about a 12-week time frame and maybe even a 10-week time frame to teach in, uh, January to, say, the 15th of March. And so we will try to teach the basic program in those 10 weeks or 12 weeks, whatever we get. In order to do that, uh, we, some of us, uh, Daryl Clendenin sitting back there, Daryl and I worked out a teaching se sequence this year that we think really helped us as far as teaching effectively and more quickly the calls that we wanted people to dance. Uh, some of the calls that we moved up on the list, um, we taught a partner trade quite early in our lessons. We also taught a trade by, and I know some will kind of raise their eyebrows at that. We taught a trade by early. We did that for a reason, and that is that in modern choreography, we work people in a grid, and that we work them across the set in the chicken plucker routine. If they understand that trade by, we felt we could get them into the grid quicker, that they would understand how modern square dance choreography works. That was one of the thinkings, or one of our thinkings as we. Uh, progress through this list and it worked really really well they understood a partner trade without much problem and uh, we were real pleased with that we also um, worked a lead to the right very early and a veer to the left we did not lead to the right circle to a line we did a heads lead to the right veer left 
bend the line, lead to the right, right and left through, veer left, bend the line. We tried to get people to understand what a line was first so that they could see and visualize a line as easily as we could get them into it. We also did a star through early on. Uh, heads promenade half down the middle, star through, pass through. Uh, you're looking at the outside too, star through. Again, we had lines, pass through, bend the line. We worked that type of thing early on uh, to get people into lines. And then when we decided to teach a lead to the right and circle, or teach a circle to a line, they already knew lead to the right. They already knew what lines were. And then all we had to teach was the call, circle to a line. It takes a lot of preparation to do that. Uh, if I could, could I have a square real quickly? All right. Yeah. Found another lady. Okay. So uh, we are not going to embarrass any of you, believe me. Um, what what we tried to do was analyze how we called and, and how square dancing goes in modern choreography. And again, remember, we are trying to teach the basic program uh, to people in 10 weeks. And one of the things that we decided to do was to do a partner trade. For instance, heads, if you would, pass through and partner trade. Now, of course, I went through the sequence how to teach a partner trade and stuff, but I want you to understand what we, what we did with that. Heads again, pass through partner trade. Um, we worked this call, heads promenade half down the middle, pass through partner trade. To get this partner trade down in their minds, we also worked to star through. For instance, heads promenade half down the middle, star through, and again, we taught a star through early in the lessons, third or, what was it, third or fourth week, Daryl? Right in there somewhere. Okay, pass through. Now, this is the grid that I'm talking about. Most modern square dance choreography works on this grid. We either work people over here or over here, and then we take them back across on that chicken plucker routine. Uh, and you can do all kinds of things once they could do this. Now, do a right and left through, okay? Pass through. Then we went through the teach on a trade by. Rather than doing a dive through and a pass through, we felt that we could accomplish more with a partner trade and a trade by. So the ends on, on our partner trade, just ends partner trade, and centers pass through. We felt that we could begin to work these people on this grid much more effectively. Again, do a right and left through. Pass through, trade by. We found that the new dancers handled this really quite well. They had no problems with it at all. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of repetition, but all square dancing takes repetition. Now we wanted to work some lines. They already knew star through. They could do their trade buys. They could do a partner trade. So uh, let's do this, star through. Now we have lines. We had them reach over, touch, so that they in fact do have lines. Okay, pass through. And any time that you bend something, what do you do? You bend it in the center. The ends would move forward, the centers would back up, and you would make a new line. Let's bend the line. Okay. Right away, third or fourth week, uh, about the fourth week, I think, we were into these lines, we could do things like this. We could pass through, bend the line. These people actually were dancing. They were moving forward. Uh, we had them dancing right away, and uh, we found it worked real successfully. Do a right and left through. Pass through again. And again, if, if you're going to teach a bend the line, you have to have people understand that when you have a line, you have centers and ends. The ends are going to move forward, the centers are going to back up, you bend something in the middle. So let's bend the line, okay? Star through, okay? Now they're right back looking at their corner. Uh, you can, we, we could do all kinds of things from here. Star through, right and left through. Star through, okay? All this kind of choreography works from here. Do a right and left through, turn a girl, pass through, trade by. When you get over here, you can do the same calls, but it feels differently because you've used the grid. You've used the chicken pucker to take them across the street. Star through. Right and left through. 
turn the girl star through okay right and left through and again pass through trade by alaman left okay we are dancing this type of material already third and well about the fourth week actually um, we were very pleased with that we also moved up the call veer to the left uh, heads lead to the right we taught this call heads lead to the right end of call end of call everybody thinks or a lot of dancers at least think that a lead to the right means you circle to a line and that's not true and we eliminated a lot of that by just doing this we had the heads lead to the right now do a right and left through they understand that call they understand the star through the pass through the trade by now why can't we do a veer to the left it's a very simple call for beginning dancers everybody veer left you slide to the left step forward and here we are we have a line again we can teach another bend the line even though it's a two-faced line where do you bend it you bend it in the center bend the line okay these were were calls that we felt really worked good and were very efficient at getting the dancers to moving uh, to the music and getting them to understand modern choreography as we as they will see at a dance uh, let's see do a right and left through turn a girl two ladies chain something else that you can do do a right and left through star through okay uh, just all kinds of things that you can do from these types of setups all right um, do a right and left through veer to the left bend the line okay do a right and left through again star through pass through alaman left get some right back to their corner all with calls they know and what have I done about five calls what have we done five calls star through right and left through pass through partner trade trade by uh, lead right and bend the line so I've done seven veer left I've done eight okay we've done eight calls uh, certainly we're doing more than that we've done a dose a do uh, that type of thing but these are calls major calls that get people starting to move now the last one well uh, another thing we did we started with a square through and Daryl brought my attention to this that I did not use enough different positions for an Alaman left we started doing a square through uh, and I won't go into the teach on the square through let's just have the head square through four we worked it this way everybody teaches the square through this way works very nicely and you have to get the dancers to understand that when you square through four you wind up back to back with the, the people you were working with now we've finished the square through four and we can do another square through four that's this is what Daryl was talking about if we square through four again let's do that square through four one two three and four leaves you facing out doesn't it what did I teach before I taught a partner trade okay let's do that partner trade now most of us do our, our Alaman less from a box of four but if we did a square through three let's do that square through three one two three here's a different Alaman left position Alaman left and the right back home gives you three different looks at a square through without getting kinky at all everybody's in a normal position girl on the right side and it gives you three different looks at a square through let's see it from the other way side square through four okay they're looking at the outside too and again it, it takes some preparation for people to understand what their square through is going to do of course but now square through four again one two three and four they're facing out again we have already taught that partner trade let's do a partner trade square through three one two three alaman left gives them a different alaman left position to look at so that they understand that the alaman left isn't always going to be the girl right in front of them we need to do that because when they go to a dance that's what they're going to see they're going to see that alaman left from a square through three just like we saw here uh, worked very very efficiently the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, we talked about we did lines 
and we had everybody doing the lines. To teach circle to a line, Jack is going to disagree with me, and that's fine. But we wanted to teach circle to a line efficiently and quickly. And the easiest way that I found to do it was heads lead to the right. They already know this call. They know this call, and they know it does not mean circle to a line. They know it means just lead to the right. Now, if you circle to a line, the way I taught it is to join your four hands, circle half. They understand circle half. Okay, veer to the left. They also understand that call. They've been doing it. The couple with their back to the center, California twirl. What do you have? Circle to a line. And they understand that that is all it was, was a circle to a line. Uh, I found that to be the quickest way to teach. Now, that is technically not the same as Jack's definition is going to be. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but it is an efficient way that I found to teach circle to a line. If you would just uh, circle back to home, we'll do it again for you. Heads lead to the right, end of call, and dancers need to hear that, end of call, end of call. Okay, if we circle to a line, circle half, veer left, the couple with her back to the center, California twirl. They never question as to who breaks. Who breaks to a line? If your back's to the center, you California twirl. That we found worked very, very well for us, and just one of the little techniques that that we used in Mesa this year that worked quite efficiently. Okay, I want you to give these guys a nice hand for coming out and demonstrating for us. Thank you. Do you guys mind oh, stay right, stay right up there. Oh. I don't want you to have to stand. I need to talk a little bit. Okay. I'm going to turn this over to Jack Murtha, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. I, I want to try and set a frame of reference for the kinds of things that I'm going to say. Would you? We can try to handle questions for people. Um, Square dancing at this particular time in our history, to me, is at a uh, juncture that's giving us a lot of problems. When I came back to Caller Lab as little as three years ago, I could find lots of people who didn't think square dancing was in much problem relative to a declining population. Um, as of last year, I've not found any single person at Caller Lab and most other places I go that doesn't feel that we've lost a lot of dancers and our population is getting smaller. Uh, there are some real reasons that's happening. And there are some things that we can do to make a difference. But I'm still in the process of experimenting with things in my own community. I've been doing this for several years now, and I'm starting to feel like I'm coming closer and closer to where this is going to really work out. But you have to understand my orientation, my whole evaluation, whether something's successful or not, says, did square dancing as a whole grow or not? And if I'm still answering myself that square dancing didn't grow, then I'm saying I still haven't found the answer because I don't know what's keeping people uh, from coming in. I'm trying a lot of things. but So that's my evaluation. I look at this. We have two-tenths of one percent of the population in the United States in square dancing as of the 1990 census. Now, we're in the census program now, and hopefully by the end of the year we'll know where we are right now, but my guess is that we've dropped considerably from the 375,000 we found in 1990. Now, there's a difference, you have to understand, between a club growing and being successful and square dancing growing and being successful. We put on a conference in our area last year and we invited three successful square dance clubs from all over California to come in and talk to us. The criteria, they've been a club for over 20 years. They each have over 200 members. They run beginner's classes every year with five to more squares. And um, so we said, well, what do you do that's working when everybody else around you is having all this problem? And we found out a lot of interesting things. So you can have a successful square dance club that individually is growing without square dancing as a whole growing. We have clubs who manage to attract a lot of square dancers from other clubs, but they don't attract brand new people that have never square danced before. And we can't grow as an activity 
until we can somehow tap into that 99.8% of the population in the country that does not square dance and isn't at this point interested in joining any of our classes. Until we find a way to open square dancing up, we've closed it to a certain select group of people. We can't uh, start growing until we open it up again to a lot of people who are not now going to be part of this program. And I've never found any way to make things grow from the top down. For me, you can only make things grow by planting roots very deep and helping and nourishing to make things grow up. So this is where I have come finally today, and one of the things I'm going to try to do here. I now believe that the major program in square dancing is the most neglected program in square dancing, the basic program. When all of you go back home, I'd defy any of you to walk out someplace and find a basic dance or even a basic club. As long as that's the way it's going to be, square dancing won't grow. You'll be able, when it starts really growing, to go out and in every community find a whole bunch of basic clubs, a whole bunch of basic programs. You can go dancing every weekend to a good basic program with a caller who knows what he's doing and can make that the nicest dance you've ever been to. Then we have a chance at a bunch of that group of people that are over here now and are not going to be coming into a plus beginner's program. We have a lot of people in square dancing who are never going to go into an advanced program, just like we have a lot of people staying out that aren't interested in what we ask in the way of commitment to become a plus dancer in 10 months. And so I'm really zeroed in on this basic program thing, and that's what I want to try and present for the time that I have here today. Some things for you to think about in terms of teaching. In my program now, I'm zeroed in on a one-year program for basic. That comes as a result of some caller lab sessions, mainly with Jack Lazary several years ago, who came to the same conclusion. He uh, gave us quite a nice talk here, and boy, left a big impression about mainstream and basic. And uh, he zeroed in on the 48 basic calls for a first year program. And within three years, he and six other callers he talked into working with him had 590 some people in their beginner classes learning the basic program. So, um, in terms of the basic program, in order to make that work and to make it interesting, there are several things you have to keep in mind. One of the things that happens here, we get people suggesting every once in a while we drop some more basic calls. They've taken away Cross Trail 2. They've taken Swat the Flea, put it in the challenge program. Programs like that have all kinds of calls. And they can do very easily without Star Thu and Do Paso. Our basic program only has 48 calls. That's all. That's all we use. And I'm expecting people to dance with me for five years at basic program level and have a good time. Well, here's another reinforcement for it. I had one couple come up to me at a one-night stand recently, say, we started dancing with you 20 years ago. We danced with you for two years, and we never went to one single workshop that you didn't teach us something new said, we love ballroom dancing, and we came to you. We thought there'd be an end to this. Someplace we'd get to the point where we could just come and dance and have a good time. Said, you never. So we quit and went back to ballroom dancing. The last 20 years, they've been ballroom dancing. I've had two other people tell me that. I had one quit the second night of class for the same thing. We do have people who would like to just come and dance. What Dance well. Dance to good choreography. Lots of fun. But not learn something new every night. Um, I'm going to ask these folks to help me illustrate uh, calls that we don't use very much or we don't use in ways that will make them interesting to people to stay in a basic program. Well, I have to give you one more frame of reference, then we'll start. One more frame of reference. I think probably all of you could agree with this, even though you don't, aren't familiar with the research or interested in the research about it. But whenever I take a group of people, I could take this group right out of the center here and ask you to come up for me to teach you something you've never done before, something that's brand new to you. Before I start, I know within that group I'm going to have a learning rate spread of about one to five. That means whatever it is I choose to teach this group that's been randomly selected, 
I know somebody is going to learn it very fast. They're right up the top of the list. I know somebody else in the class is going to take five times as much practice and instruction as that first person. I just don't know yet who they are. I know they're in there. And then I've got people spread all the way through that. So when I start teaching my class, just what Laurel was talking about, they don't all learn at the same speed. And so I have to accommodate that. And one of the ways, it's very hard to accommodate. I'll give you an example of three kinds of people I've got in my class at present. I have one fellow who came in class, and he in, infuriated with himself every time he makes a mistake. Man alive, he just almost put on a tantrum, not at me or the dancers, at himself, every time he made a mistake. Now, he started two years ago in my beginning program. He's just finishing mainstream now because I don't let people move on up. I teach people, not calls, and I don't let them move up until they personally can handle the material without error. And now, though, the last night we had one of the best nights with him, and he made mistakes, but that uh, problem doesn't exist anymore. He'd make a little wince with his face so I could tell he was thinking about it, but he stopped that behavior. It's taken me a long time to get him over it, but he stopped it. I have two other ladies in class who are obviously not auditory learners because I can stand there, use them to demonstrate so I'm going to talk right to them, and then when I go back, put people in squares and start, they didn't hear a word I said. They don't do, they do exactly what I said not to do or don't do what I just finished explaining and showing them. But in square dancing, everybody has to be an auditory learner first. Because when they're dancing, I don't want them waiting and watching to see what somebody else does before they start. That's what these people do. Or waiting and putting out both hands and hoping somebody will give them a clue as to what they're supposed to do. They've got to hear me, and they get one half second from the time they hear me to the next beat of music when they start doing it. And they have to become skilled auditory learners in order to stay with a modern-day sight caller who can change all calls on an instant notice. When he starts, he's not even sure himself what he's going to do. And so that person dancing has to get so involved listening that they hear every word while they're dancing, and they also uh, are able to react correctly without watching or any help from anybody else. Uh, anyway, that'll make the, illustrate the point that when you get dancers in your class, they're all individuals. It isn't one class. It's a class of 35 or 40 people, each individual in terms of their learning problems and their learning styles and the way things work. Now, I've tried a lot of ways. I bring in people. I, if I have one dancer having a problem, I'll bring in seven club members who are good dancers to dance with them on Saturday morning, and we just zero on a problem, that one dancer that's having problems with seven people I know aren't going to make any mistakes. That's the other problem, teaching those guys, because if they finally do it right and somebody else in the square makes a mistake, they're convinced it was them again that made it. So I, I uh, will put together squares like that at night after class or weekends or whenever I have to. We also, though, find that's very hard. So my feeling is the basic program, again, is the kind of a program that will accommodate all this problem. If I keep my basic dancers going for a year, within that year I can cover that one to five ratio. What's the beauty of that? If I start everybody at the same place for the next level, the next program, there is a gap of only one to one and a half in learning rate. They almost are one class now. But that's not until everybody in it has a common prior experience and skill level. Now I can move them as a group. I can't do that in a short class or a short exposure, but I can do it over a year's time with the kind of things I want to suggest here. So that's another one of the reasons. Thank you. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, okay, if you'll square them up. I'm going to start off, I don't know, I, our time's going quick, isn't it? We, all right, well, don't forget, let me know because I want people to have time for questions. Fascinating thing, I want you to watch these people do three calls for me. And all of them can do the first one, roll away with a half sachet. Now, join hands, circle left. Ladies in the men's sachet. Circle left. 
all the way around and when you get back to your home position, one and three a half sachet, two and four a half sachet. Now I don't know if all of you are seeing what I'm seeing as a very common thing in that or not. But if you look at it closely, you'll notice the men do the same thing in all three calls. Only the lady has to do something different. One time she has to roll away. Next time she goes in and back. Next time she slides over. I got feedback from my ladies that said when I use a lot of half sachets, it would sure be nice to get that easy part the men do. Sachet, and that means the right goes in front. We've put together a whole bunch of programs that use half sachets in different ways, and it's now something that people no longer ask me when I call it, uh, what's different between a half sachet and a roll away? And it comes as a result of ladies coming up and telling me that using it as much as I use it, roll away is hard for some people in crowded situations, and it takes longer, and it's just not that much fun. So here's a few ideas for using a half sachet. Now I'm just going to dance through this. This will all be on the tape so you can get a chance to see it. Hang on a minute. I just don't feel good without this thing hooked on so I can turn that music on. Yep, that's it. First and third, promenade halfway. Now do a half sachet. You pass through and you turn back. Pass through promenade partner home. Two and four, promenade halfway. Two and four, now a half sachet. Pass through and separate around two. Hook on to the end, make a line, move up to the middle and back. Just the men do a half sachet. Just the ladies do a half sachet. Center's a half sachet. Everybody a half sachet. Everybody pass through and a U-turn back. Pass through and face your partner. Say hello, corner. Alaman left. Come back in a right, a left, grand, grand, right, a left. All the way around and meet again and promenade home. Now couple two and four promenade halfway around. Two and four to the middle and pass through and wheel around. The man backs up, the lady goes forward. Two ladies chain, three quarters round. Side men turn them with an arm around and then do a half sachet, make a line of three up to the middle and back. Lonesome men pass through, both turn right, go around three people, hook on and everybody join hands and circle to the left, go round that land and circle left. Ladies in the men's sachet, circle to the left that way. Now circle to the right, go the other way around. Ladies in the men's sachet, and right and left, grand. Grand, right and left, hand over hand, they're gonna meet again. Nominate all eight, round the land to get back home. There's a whole lot of interesting things to do with a half sachet. It is nice for the ladies when you use it as much as I did there, and I use it in a lot of other things too, to do that instead of the roll away. And uh, so that's one call that I find often when I call a dance on the weekend, I have to explain to dancers this isn't roll away before they start dancing with me through all of these things, but it doesn't take longer than an instant to just let them know, so it's not a big problem. Now, one other thing, dancing fractions. I make a point out of helping and teaching uh, our dancers how to recognize and dance fractions. Again, now, all of this is, in, from my standpoint, is helping you to understand there are a lot of things you can do with a basic program to extend this teaching and party time and have a good time with it, good dancing. I see my uh, dancers in the basic program after the first night or two of dancing, they're already dancers. I can put on a two-hour party with my school programs with just six or seven calls, and I can do the same with the adults. So they're dancers. They can do all kinds of different things. If we just give them time to learn and dance, you'll bring them all together instead of spreading them out and keeping them spread out. Here's some dancing fractions. One 
One and three promenade, go halfway around. Now circle four in the middle, three quarters round. Same couples pass through, circle four, three quarters round. Back it out, Jerry, there's those lines of four. Go up to the middle and come on back. Do a right and left through. Same lady chain. Same couples circle four, three quarters round. Same couples a half sachet and a right and left grand. Grand, right and left go round. Meet her and a promenade down. Promenade home. Square your set. One and three promenade, three quarters outside. Two and four circle left, three quarters on the inside. Back out. Same couples promenade outside, three quarters. The others circle left, three quarters. Back out. All four ladies star right in the middle. Star promenade your partner. Take him with an arm around. Everybody, when you get back home, back out at home and face your partner to right and left grand. Grand, go right and left round that ring. We can get a lot of smooth action out of some of these calls that people don't use a lot. All right. I'm going to skip some of the rest of this. I think you get the point, and let me move on up to one other one. Now, this is one I use to illustrate my idea for three, a 313 three kinds of teaching. In other words, when I teach something, what I want, if I can, is I want the same call presented in three with three different lead-ins and three different get-outs, but the person does exactly the same thing in the call each time uh, that you're using it. And I want to teach it six times that way. I'll have to stop after this one. I've got a bunch more stuff there, but I'll just do this one and then uh, get the question. All right, well, we'll do the rest, too. If I don't wear you guys out, I know it's hard to dance on that floor, that carpet, you okay? All right, here we go. First and third, square through, four hands round the ring you go. With the outside couple, swing through. Boys run to the right, and everybody Ferris wheel. Now centers veer to the left, and veer to the right. Now veer right again, and veer to the left. Everybody, you turn back. Now touch a quarter, walk and dodge. Partner trade, pass through, and a U-turn back. A right and left through. Same lady, chain across, then turn them on around, and when you do that, star through. Pass to the center, square through, three hands around. Alaman left foot the corner, come back home, square he set. Two and four, promenade outside, halfway around. Down the middle with a right and left through, and turn them on around. Now square through, four hands around, you go one time and then swing through with the outside. Boys run right, everybody Ferris wheel. Centers veer left, veer to the right. Veer to the right, veer to the left. Now centers veer, wait a minute, center. Oh, everybody, you turn back. Touch a quarter. Do the walk and dodge. Partner trade. All pass through and a U turn back. Pass the ocean there and the ladies, you trade. Now, I wrote a lot of this just to make sure I could get these points in. Uh, Ladies trade, did you do that? Swing through. Boys run. Wheel and deal. Outsides only, half sachet. Pass to the center and turn through. Find the corner, Alaman left. Square your set. Now two and four. Uh-oh, what did I do? Put you out? Sorry about that. Okay, two and four, square through four. Everybody, touch a quarter. Check your way. Swing through. Swing through again. Now walk and dodge. Ladies fold in front of the man and star through. Now couples circulate one place, bend the line and do the right and left through. Same lady, chain across. And now, star through. Dive into the middle, pass through, pass to the center, square through. Three hands around and find the corner with an alaman left, square your set. 
Now, the point I want to make about some of this, I wanted to get the half sachet and the idea in that I had three different ways of getting to Walk and Dodge and three different ways of getting out of it. But in each case, the lady did the walking and the man did the dodging. In case you missed them, the first time before the Walk and Dodge, we did a touch a quarter. Uh, in the last one, we did a swing through before. And uh, following the one in the middle, we did a partner trade as we came out of it. So we try to do different things in front and after the call. But one of the things important to note here is our definitions and uh, books wrong on veer left, veer right. They make it sound like veer left and veer right are the two different things that can happen. They're not. First and third uh, lead to the right and veer left. The first variation is what you do when you're facing a couple. And you veer either right or left in order to come to a two-faced line. Second thing is what you do when you're in a two-faced line. And you can veer either left or right from there, veer right. So instead of veer left and veer right being the two distinctions you try to manipulate, what you need to manipulate is people facing people to veer left or right and people who are in a two-faced line to veer left or right. Okay, square it up. Let me do this one last one of the uh, walk and dodge ones. Now, one and three pass through in a U-turn back. Everybody join hands, circle left like that. Now, put the men at the head positions. Men lead to the right, make an ocean wave. Walk and dodge. Everybody do a U-turn back, pass through, and a partner trade you do, star through, pass to the center, and pass through an Alaman left. Come back, promenade home. So in that case, we had lead to the right. In another one, we had touch a quarter. And in another one, we had um, the swing throughs. Okay, well, so much for the three and one idea. But the idea basically is in thank you if you are creative if you think through a little bit you'll find a different way to lead the call just before you say walk and dodge should be different not always touch a quarter the call after you say walk and dodge should be different every time for at least three things that you can manipulate not partner trade over and over and over and you'll get a lot more interest and a lot more fun out of dancing with us. Now, I'm going to take just a last minute and go through some grand square variations. Grand square is one of my all-time favorites to work with. And in the 1960s, I developed a way to teach grand square that I see a lot of people using now, where we have two rules for walking and turning. And if you teach that, the advantage is it opens up almost 20 different variations of grand square that anybody can do if they know the two rules. The two rules apply to all but one variation of grand square. There's one my favorite of all time does not apply. You have to apply different rules to teach it. So I won't do that one here. But um, they know grand square well enough they don't have to understand the rules or worry about it. They just do that. Okay, here we go. I'll show you a few variations that you can think about. Apologize. Sorry. Watch here. Two and four face your partner. One and three are facing the opposites across the hall. Rule number one. When I say walk, if you are close enough to the person you're facing to touch hands, that's the sides, then you back away. If you are across the square where you can put your hands up and you can't touch, you walk toward each other. Don't do anything else. Forget everything else you know about grand square. Do only rule one. Walk. One, two, three, four. Walk. One, two, and you're back where you started. <laughs> Try one more time. Notice the ones close back away. The ones that are backed off walk together. Walk. One, two, three, walk. One, two, all right. Rule two. If you're facing your partner and the caller gives you a grand square and says turn, you turn to face the opposite across the hall. 
If you're facing the opposite across the hall, you turn to face your partner. You never turn your back toward the center of the square, and you never face anybody else, only partner and opposite. Ready? Turn. Turn. All right? Now, we'll just go through a grand square so you can see how those operate. Then I'll show you some variations to take advantage of the knowledge of those rules. Ready? Go. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. One, two, don't turn. Reverse. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. Turn and you're back home. And notice that each person is sharing a little small square in their corner of the big square. Two people working on different sides of that, and they stay on their own private square in their own corner. All right, here we go. <laughs> Head couples promenade half. Side space. Everybody ready? Grand square. Now these are just some simple adjustments, but they're enough so people have to think a little bit about it. And stay in time, hopefully. Now the head two couples star through. Square through three quarters. Split two, round one, come back. Are you home? No, do a right and left through down the middle heads. Sorry. I left out the half sachet. Now one other one. Heads pass through and you turn back. Two and four pass through and you turn back. Heads go up to the middle and come right back. Side space your partner. Everybody in. Grand square. Now I'm going to cut this one short and everybody join all hands and circle left. Put the ladies in the men's sachet. Alaman left with the corner. Come back, square your set at home. Head gents, take your corner girl by the hand. Go in, uh -huh, just the head gent corner, into the middle and come back way out. The other two face each other, touch both hands. Now look around and recognize you're ready for a grand square. Everybody go. One. Face your corner, now a man left. Come back home and square your set. Two and four, or let's have one and three face your partner. Everybody, grand square, go. Now those at the sides, back up and, face, and join hands with the hips. Go up to the middle and come on back. Everybody do a pass through and a U-turn back. Then a right left through, turn the lady. Two ladies chain. Chain back. Just those ends. Do sado all the way around. Face each other. Touch both hands. Everybody grand square. Go. One, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. Back out at home. Or wait, no. Alaman left. Come back, square your set. I'm not going to take time to work these guys out of this. You've got the idea anyway. Let me do one more. Head two, do a right and left through. Same couple, square through four. Side space and grand square. Head separate, go round one. Down the middle, pass through, cross with your partner, find the corner and swing the corner. Keep her, everybody promenade around and don't stop, keep going. One and three, do a wheel around, everybody pass through, everybody wheel around, do a half sachet. Now pass through and cross with your partner, do a right and left grand. Grand, right, left, meet your partner over there again, promenade all eight. Can I do that to you again? No, we're right. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's enough just to get the idea that uh, there are a whole lot of interesting things you can do if you teach rules and get the people to dance them. Now, this is not APD dancing. 
APD refers to the idea that you can do these calls from every formation that's possible to do them in every way you can. I have only one thing I'm trying to do. If a call like walk and dodge has two parts to it, I want everybody to learn both parts. If a call like Grand Square has a timing and a variation set up, I want people to know the timing and stay with it, and I want them to dance the parts well and be ready to put them together by rule in a number of different variations. How about a big hand for these guys helping us? Thank you very, very much. Okay, I'm going to quit, and thank you very much also for all your attention. Jack and Jerry, we thank you both. I'm sure that some of you may now have questions or comments or suggestions that you'd like to share. We're going to ask that you use the mic. I'll go ahead and turn it on and hope I don't get any feedback. My name is Dan Koft. A uh, couple of things that I do with my classes. Number one, I let them know I'm human. Eventually, I will be making a mistake in my class. Uh, in, and I usually make sure it happens in the first night. Mainly because you know, I'll make the mistake, and I will admit it. I say, that one is mine. Make sh and I let them know that you know that mistake that happened there was mine. Not their fault. To make sure that they know that it's all right. Mistakes happen. We're human. I also um, tell them, if at first you don't succeed, you're about average. <laughs> I get that same response from them also. It lets them know having fun is the idea. We're having fun here. And I, all, and I get the best compliment from my angels and from my class people. They'll go away and they say, gee, that was a lot of fun. And if I, I, if I get that, I know I'm succeeding. I'm going to hang on to the microphone and I'll pass it around. Uh, Jerry Hardy, Stone Ridge, New York. I have a question for Jerry. When you teach partner trade early, uh, is it... Do you teach California twirl before partner trade? The question was, do I teach California twirl? No. Uh, we decided to teach partner trade, and we waited with the California twirl till just before we taught circle to the line. We went ahead and taught partner trade first. Yes, somebody in the back there? Oh, right here? Ken Perkins from uh, South Carolina. When I teach my class, the first thing I do is teach them square through a left alaman, right and left grand circle, and then square through. I get in and get out real quick. In order to get them dancing to a singing call, regardless of whatever it is, as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. and that way, I get them to having fun. And once I get them to having fun, the rest is easy. But I, but I do get them dancing the very basic singing call. If I just do a left out of man and right and left grand to the tune of the music, then I have a lot more fun with it. Oh, I think that's true, and I, I think uh, most of us, uh, show of hands, how many uh, do singing calls the very first night? I think that's pretty much standard, and I, I would agree. People enjoy that. Kip Garvey, California. I have a question for, for Jack. Jack, you started your uh, your segment by making a statement about the basic program being one of the most underused or overlooked, neglected. That's an accurate representation of what you said, right? I believe it is. I think you could go through uh, most of our books and manuals. You can look at the National Convention. There's no basic program schedule at any big convention I know of. There's uh, uh, all of our books you can look through and find out what callers are calling, and there's nothing there that says this is a basic club and a basic program. I think people only use it to see how fast they can go through it on the way to plus. And that's not use of the basic program. That's not teaching it or using it. That's just zooming through it as fast as you can get out of the way and get into that good stuff up there with plus. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And it's a great observation, and I agree with it 100%. My question to you is, and you know what area I'm from, 99 and 9 tenths percent plus, suppose I want to implement a good basic program in my area. How do you suggest I go about doing that? Should I do it with a coalition of other callers in the area? Should I do it on my own? What's your suggestion? Okay, that's a wonderful question, and I have certainly my own opinions about it. Number one, I don't believe that clubs should be responsible for starting and teaching basic programs. In square dancing today, almost all our club 
classes are run by clubs. So I believe, number one, anything you do, like in an area that you have, you'd have to do the same way Jack Lazary did it in his. He got six professional callers together who are excellent teachers and said, we're going to run a basic program. And he ran it. Nobody told him what to do, when to do it, or anything else. But he set it up. I know he ran it for at least six years. I'm not sure how long he ha he whether he stopped before he passed away or not. I think the same thing. I think in your area, Northern California callers should have a professional group of teachers that they hire and they sponsor. They run the classes. They teach the classes. And at the end of the basic program, they let the dancers go. Now the clubs pick them up and teach mainstream and plus. We don't have anything to do with teaching past basic. That's up to the clubs. Let them set up their own mainstream and plus program. But we're going to furnish them a group of dancers who know basic so well that you can do almost anything you want with basic programs. And a bunch of them are going to say to you, hey, we're having so much fun. Why do we need to learn more calls? We want to stay with you. And so I think that program can't be run under our present organizational setup. I think it can only be run by professionals who know what they're doing and are going to run that program in a professional way. Either like Jack did it, where he got five other callers to say, all right, we'll go with you and do this, and they all did it together. So they had plenty of parties, they had plenty of places for people to go dance, and they had all good callers calling. People didn't mind spending a year at the basic program level because they were dancing and having a ball. Uh, either that or an association of callers like um, Northern Cal. And I'd incidentally not feel bad at all if Caller Lab, in its great wisdom, said maybe we do have some obligation to help areas of the country set up professionally run programs to teach the basic program and the half basic. My program now is I teach a half basic program in three months. Then the next three months, we finish the basic program. In each case, as people don't move to another program without my okay. If they're making errors and having problems, we recycle, go back through again. I have two classes at a time going on. One starts the first three-month program, and then on another night, we start the second part of that program. And every three months, we start a new class group on one or the other night. People stay on it through basic program. We don't do anything beyond that. I don't know if that gives you any help or not, but that's what I'd suggest. Uh, Nasser Shukar from Shreveport, Louisiana. A question for Dr. Murtha. Um, most, most callers, I think I did an average, and their tempo is about 129 beats a minute. I just took 10 callers at random and timed them. Um, and, and I timed yours a second ago, and it was 116 beats a minute, which is about 10% slower than uh, than what most people do. So so do you advocate slowing the pattern record down uh, to teach beginners or for, or for carpet? I, I've probably slowed it down more for carpet than for anything else because it's not an easy surface to dance on. And I will teach some things at that tempo as I'm introducing them, but I bring it back up to the 128 or 130 that's common. And I want them to dance at least that tempo because in our area we have a lot of callers who call even faster than that. And, of course, the important thing to me is that when I get finished and I say, you now are a good dancer in this, I want to be able to send them to any caller in our area and have them very uh, well received and very successful. So that's a, no a nice observation. I appreciate you saying that. But I wouldn't keep it at a very slow tempo all the time, but I might use it to introduce ideas. Gloria Roth, Nova Scotia, Canada. You made the statement when you first started, and I just wanted to clarify if I misunderstood or if you said it correctly, uh, if, if you said it the way you meant it, then I want to correct you. You said that the three calls, roll away half sachet and half sachet and ladies in men sachet, had the men doing the same thing. Sliding sideways. Well, two of them, they go to the left. Uh, I mean, two Doesn't of them matter. go to the right. They go, two... Every one of them can go either way except the roll away. As far as I'm concerned, rolling a man away is not legitimate to me. It is no, to no. some people. No, no. But I think he the men answered, either I think go. He, is, he answered what I said. He, uh, I understood you meant the men were all moving the same way. You and I did pick up on the fact that you said women. Uh, I'm somehow away. not connecting with you. But okay. My on roll away with a half sachet, the men counter dance to the right. On half sachet with a standard woman on the right, the men also move to the right. But on ladies in the men's sachet, no, they I'm move not, to the left. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about oh, the right, men slide sideways. One All way three 
all three calls, a man just slides one way or the other. One way or the other. The That's ladies right. do something different on each yes. of the three calls. Okay, I wanted to clarify it for my own sake. Thank and you. I, I think that one of the things, I never understood why people don't use half sachet more. Be, but I'm beginning to believe it might have something to do with the fact that the men are all doing the same thing every time, and so it doesn't really matter much to them which one they use. But for the lady who has to change for all three of them, I've had them come and t that's why I changed. I've done this deliberately because they talked to me about doing the other one. And uh, uh, Jimmy Burst from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I did like your Grand Square presentation very much, and I teach Grand Square the first night of lessons, so the dancers feel that they've really accomplished something. I don't know if it's good or bad, but that's what I do as a teaching technique. I also teach the square through before right and left through, and I have nobody courtesy turning on a right and left through or on a square through, because they don't know that yet. Um, they haven't had the experience of the right pull by courtesy turn, and to do a right and left through. I have the dancers pass through and use the call courtesy turn to achieve that. So right and left through comes further down the line, and I can still achieve the right and left through by just saying pass through courtesy turn, and it's accomplished the same in my mind, and in the dancer's mind, they're not getting confused between the right and left through and the square through. Just a little thing that I do. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, uh, I'm Al Singleton from Baytown, Texas. I noticed, Jerry, when you were using your figure out there, you were using a, I'm thinking about body flow, you were using a star through and a right and left through following that. Is that good or bad? I hear conflicts both ways. Please comment. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, there are all kinds of, of those um, things that happen. I do not have a problem with star through and right and left through simply because the hand comes down. Yeah. It moves into position. Uh, there are a lot of calls that I do not use because I think the body flow or the hand use is just wrong. That's one I don't personally have a problem with. One thing you all want to remember when you're doing teaching, Jack directed his toward the basic program. I tried to as well. My teaching techniques had to do with, with uh, more of a lesson plan than anything else. We went into our program with a plan. All of you need to do that. You need to have a plan as to how you're going to approach it. Daryl and I talked to each other every morning. We, I did a class. We had a lot of the dancers go to the same class with him. We discussed what we were going to teach, how we were going to teach it, how we were going to present it, how far we were going to take it. Also keep into consideration when you're teaching at a basic level or any level, for that matter, any program, that there's an easy, medium, and a hard way to do a call. Be sure that you understand what's the easy way. I really believe in presenting a call the easy way first. Get people to understand the concept of the call, how the call works, and then progress through the easy, medium, and hard ways to do that call. Keep that in mind. I'm Mike Missio from Chalmette, Louisiana. And uh, we, were talking, we were talking about your half sachet move and... Uh, I always would like to say I don't think in our area it was taught so much, and it may have not been taught so much in other areas I don't know about. But half sachet, I believe, is one of the main calls in basic to uh, get people uh, half sacheted, and it it uh, it uh, it was mostly not taught because roll away half sachet I think in, in a circle is so easy to teach that they concentrated on that so much they left half sachet out which I feel was a bad thing to do because I think that led to taking cross trail throughout uh, of, of, of the uh, basic uh, basic uh, program because cross trail through is nothing more than a pass through with a cross with a half sachet and I think that's one of the reasons why it was left by the wayside I think and I think if we would have uh, taught it more we wouldn't have got uh, cross trail through out so much Yona Chalk, Eva Beach, Hawaii I wanted to talk to Jack about you mentioned you trained him in the basic and then sent him out for the clubs to pick up for mainstream I really feel that if you have 
train people in the basic, then you have a responsibility to provide at least a once a month basic dance that they can come back to. And a lot of our problems with dropouts are that there are no basic dances where they can keep going until whatever financial or physical problem slowed them down to keep them out of the mainstream clubs existed. So it's a good training ground for new callers, too, if they're required to call for a year at a basic program. Uh, maybe we ought to suggest that that be a requirement that they need to to do calling at that level before they're turned loose to run wild with mainstream and plus. Let me just say that uh, you're right with me because we do that. We have a monthly basic program, a party night, and we have some of the best callers in our area who are very skilled at that kind of programming that are sharing that with me. And we're already talking now about next year. Uh, we have two of us at least now running two-year programs to plus, so we have time. Uh, mine's even longer than two years. The other one has just gone to two-year program. And so we have time for a basic program of fun dancing. And uh, we're starting to schedule hoedowns next year already. All right. uh, this is Bill Harrison uh, from Maryland. I'd like to reiterate a little bit on what Kip had uh, brought up um, in this whole hour or whatever the case may be. Jack has referred to Jack Lazary, who did this program, but he got the consensus of six other callers to do the same thing. I think that is right there what we need to think about. A lot of times when you're in a meeting, you hear some good ideas. Gee, we need to really work on this. So you go home, and you're the only one doing it. And you're going to be faced with the situation that Yona had mentioned. What do I do with these folks now? You may want to spend time to get with the Callers Association or some callers in your area. Notice that Jerry had mentioned that when he was doing his teaching process, he got with Daryl. So two people are doing the same thing. I just wanted to make that mention that it's very important that if you're going to do something like that, make sure you have a collective audience that's going to be doing the same thing so that it does work. Okay? Thank you. Um, I'm just going to interject right here on what Yana said and, and sort of piggyback on what Billy said. I don't think that the basic program is our very best training ground for new callers. That's where our new dancers are coming in, and we need to be sure that they're getting the very best teaching opportunities available. And we need to be spending time with those new callers. But I don't think that, that that's going to be the very best training ground for them because we, we put our new dancers at a disadvantage, and we're... We're having a problem keeping those new dancers already. Let's don't disadvantage them any further. Uh, Jack, um, I listened to... Oh, okay. my name's John Metcalf. I listened to you right here in Kansas City, you know, a few years ago. And uh, I went home and tried to put to work what I thought I was getting from you. And uh, I've had some success. Um... I'm getting more dancers, more new dancers, than anyone else in the area, by far. At times, I have as many in my classes as the whole area put together. Uh, but I'm not getting in, into the clubs. This, they're, they're not mixing. Uh, I got fired from two or three clubs. Uh, they do The old dancers do not accept the long lessons. Now, how many years has that been? And I've been doing this all this time, and... Uh, I feel like I'm probably still doing a bad job, by the way, of, of, of putting this philosophy across. Where can I learn more about it? And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss as what to do. Two things. One, uh, I talked to several other callers who I respect highly and are great callers about this. And they said, Jack, yeah, I think you're right. But I could never call that. That basic program so boring to me. I love the plus and advanced, but I couldn't stand calling a basic program. And they said to me, if you really believe in this and you think you want to do something with it, you're going to have to do that on your own. Go get programs, get them going. Now, what I feel is when I finally go from having three squares in my beginner's class to 20 squares in my beginner's class consistently, then I have a way to go to other people and say, hey, listen, i got an idea for you. But until then, I, I was just doing the same thing you're doing. I'm going to be very successful. My dancers are going to dance very well, and I'm going to do my own thing until I can finally get enough interest that people start coming and saying, what are you doing? I'd like to do that too. 
And then I have an insight on this other deal. The other question that you ask, we have a number of people in the world of square dancing who are experts at that. Uh, Jim Lee in Toronto and Canada has been running programs like this for many, many years. We've got a delegation of people from Sweden and Germany that have tremendous programs that are not time dependent. They keep basic programs going all the time. And uh, I know my feedback is from uh, Sweden, they take six months to teach the half basic program. The next six months is the basic program. And then they'll dance that as long as a year in some cases before they even start a mainstream program. I'm now in communication with some of those folks, and I'm trying to get a hold of more of them because I understand only superficially what they're doing. I need a lot more meat out of what they're doing. They do have the thing you and I don't have. They've got the cooperation of all the callers in their area. They're all doing the same thing. They're all working together. They plan and figure out what they're doing. That's my feedback. So it's you can go all across some of those places and find people doing that. So as I get any more information, I'll be writing it in my column in American Square Dance, or I'll be glad to send and share it or go to these festivals. If I get anything more, I'll share it with everybody I can get a hold of because I'd like to see this grow. Uh, I, my watch says that we're out of time. I hope that you've gotten a little bit out of the basic teach program or how to teach the basic program. You're going to take away some techniques, some ideas, and maybe you'll be able to implement some of these things that the guys have, sh have shared with you. I'd like for you to give a big hand to Jake Murth and Jerry Junk for helping out. Thank you for being here, and please go to the other sessions as, as you have an opportunity.